There's a lot of things we have to talk about. We have questions, of course, but why don't we get one of the reviews out of the way, the one that took place furthest to go. The K- Fur- uh, Furthest to go? Again, I'm still coming off all this medication, ah. but the A&E channel, the latest WWE, or not the latest anymore, but WWE oh. biography series with someone you know quite well, Kane. Oh, Christ. Okay, we were... We were going to do this last week because it did air f- further ago than the other programs we're talking about, but that's when you had your experimental f***ing baboon heart transplanted into your eardrum, and uh, and we, we skipped over it. Uh, but uh, again, now that we've... You're apparently normal now. You're completely off the drugs, and you just babble that way on... <laughs> Absolutely no reason whatsoever. We'll we'll start in on the program. And I I talked about this, whatever it was, out of when they were preparing it. Was it six months ago or a year ago or whatever? Because people had tweeted me, say, well, Jim, you should have been on this because everybody was talking about you. Well, they asked me to be on it, and I didn't want to be on it. And I I explained at the time, and obviously I've said before, just in general, I don't want to do projects anymore that a specific wrestling promotion endorses because then with all the wise asses out there, if I take somebody's money and if I ever say anything good about them, then I'm, I'm on the payroll. Uh, but if I knock anything that they'd, well, you're not too good to take their money, you know, but so you can't win with that. But again, for the former Glenn Jacobs for Kane, the gimmick, the performer, the person. I would have done it before he became a politician. And I'm just, it, it, everything that they said about him in the show that everybody said about him, I felt the same way and didn't disagree with. Uh, and he's always, you know, not only dependable, professional, and an uh, employee, never get anybody in trouble or get himself in trouble. But a great guy and smart and intelligent and et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, a lot of people jumped in at that point in time and said, oh, it's horrible. How dare somebody throw away a friendship over political differences? It's not about political differences. It's not about political differences or should you raise taxes or lower taxes or should this be legal or that be illegal or what should we do about crime or the immigration? But to me, and I'm sorry if I offend anybody, every single Republican elected official that gave a shit or continues to give a shit about being a leader of people or doing good, a public servant doing good for anybody, should be out there while he was in office, yes, definitely, but now it, it, you can't not just, you, they're, they're either still supporting fucking Donald Trump or ignoring it. And to get votes instead of trying to educate the suckers that put the Republican Party in this position and blow holes in his lies and his bullshit that has caused this goddamn chaos in the United States still to this day, lying about the election, lying about everything that he fucking was involved in. And they backed him up and they covered for him. And Glenn Jacobs is not a stupid person. I don't know any of these other people that got elected to office, but I know Glenn. He's not stupid, which means he did it for the votes. He figured these people will vote for me if I and this Republican Party will support me as long as I lie for them or just don't fucking acknowledge what the fuck has gone on and was going on. And so that's a Republican voters' big shit. They don't have a goddamn social responsibility to smarten up and go out and smarten other people up. They, can, they, they have the right to be stupid. 
but elected government officials and leaders. Glenn Jacob knows what Donald Trump is. He know he knew what he was when he first started running. And he knows what he's done. And he knows how many of these people he's gotten killed or fucking injured or goddamn just chaos happened with lying about the election and never fucking admitting it. And they wouldn't fucking, most of them, 90% wouldn't call him on it. So that's, it's right from wrong. And if 40% of the country decides they're okay with a lying criminal con man in charge, as long as he does the political shit they want, at some point, the other elected Republicans have to go, no, even if we're winning, we don't want to win this way. This is bullshit. This guy's a fucking criminal. He's an idiot. He's, he's a clear and present danger to the United States of America. He's not equipped for this job. He's in it for himself. Anything that they could have said or still say, why isn't Glenn out there saying now people of Knox County, regardless of who you voted for, we've got to get over this. This guy lied and got people killed and has created chaos. And we must recognize that. But no, he's out there still. He's got a picture out there on Twitter with his arm around Marjorie Trees and Green who still continues to support dumb fuck and thinks that the United States should be split in half, which, well, who gets the good parts, bitch? Why should we, why should I move just because you stupid people surround me? And he, or he's out there with the gun ghoul, Dana Loesch, and tweeting about, well, we're going to keep the President Trump policies, blah, blah, blah. So it tells me that Glenn is not stupid. He's doing this for votes. He won't tell the truth. He won't be honest because the stupid people that voted for him won't vote for him again because they still like Trump. But that's, if, if you want to help people, lead people, serve people, instead of being afraid you won't get reelected when you got two years or four years, why don't you go, okay, we need to have a talk, people. All of the folks that voted for me, most of you like Trump. Guess what? He lied to all of you. Here's what he really is. Somebody needs to say it. That's the way to be a public servant is not to cover for criminals. And maybe if a bunch of them had done this from the start, would they, they were going to at January 6th until they saw that the fucking suckers didn't really turn against him for that. And then instead of telling the truth, they backed up on it. But it's that's if it, maybe he wouldn't have been able to do this damage if half of the elected leaders in Washington weren't telling people that he was right just to get their fucking votes. So don't, Glenn, don't hug and pose with people who help crooks get away with shit. Whether it's the gun ghoul that fights the laws that prevent children from getting murdered or the rest of the batshit lunatics that you've associated yourself with, who were in favor of a guy who tried to start a civil war to stay in the White House instead of going to prison and got people killed in the process and all the other shit he's done. And for anybody out there that still thinks when you're, because we've gotten a bunch of emails. I can't talk to my so-and-so member of my family anymore. They're on the Trump train. And everybody that's on that Trump train, they've chalked it up to political differences. It's not. They might not want to tell you, but I will, because I've been getting these emails. Normal, level, headed, sane people in your life who always liked you and half-ass enjoyed being around you found out that you thought that anything about Donald Trump was acceptable as president of the United States, and you, we didn't consider that political differences. It was invasion of the body snatchers. We looked at you like we'd suddenly found out you'd joined a Colombian drug cartel or got arrested for a fucking series of bank robberies or started standing outside the fucking grade school sniffing jock fucking bicycle seats. It, 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 and it's like, what happened? Brian, how many times have you heard what happened to my friend Farquhar or cousin Droop Lip? 
They buy this shit. Because some people were appalled that this person would be considered for this office and that people couldn't see through it and know what was going to happen ahead of time, which is exactly all what happened. Al Capone had the same M.O. in Chicago. The criminal asshole that's running shit, as long as he keeps the people happy, they're like, okay. But he went to prison. So I, I don't blame your friend or your relative that doesn't speak to you anymore if you are a Trump sucker out there for political differences. Because they think you've lost your fucking mind and there's reason for that. So that's my commentary on Glenn Jacobs, the politician. But you want to talk about the biography? Let's talk about the biography, of course, Glenn Jacobs. And you ended up being a big part of this story. You were mentioned. You were shown. There was lots of Smoky Mountain wrestling footage. Let's talk about the career of the man who would become Kane. You know, but I wonder if I'd have gone to A&E in 1993 and said, air my wrestling program. What do you think they would have said? It looked good. <laughs> on the air, well, didn't yes, it? Yes, it did. But hey, was there an A&E in 1993? Yes, but it was more opera and uh, legitimate biographies, I believe, still. Well. Not produced by the source that's looking for the positive PR in the biography. Anyway. Um, no, it, it covered his, you know, his early life. And, you know, he was a big kid, obviously, in Missouri. And when it got to, I'm glad that that Christmas creature feature video was shown because now maybe it'll get the heat off of me because for whatever reason, he got, he got into the business with some indie out there and I've, you know, they didn't even go into a lot of detail about his early training, but since he was from Missouri, that's right close to the Memphis territory, they were still operating and, you know, they saw a guy that big and the reason why I don't have any reason to dispute the, you know, the story that they gave on, well, we had the sketch for the Christmas creature, but the reason why they wanted to cover him up was because they wanted people to think it was Sid Vicious, who had just, I think at that point, I think Sid was out of one of the big promote, one of his periods of time where he was not actively on television because he was home playing softball or hurt or whatever. But or either that or maybe he was on TV, but they thought he'd come home because Sid every once in a while would show up in Memphis again just because he's home. So they dressed Glenn up in that outfit. But did you hear the brief clip? They said, I think it was, was it Kevin Lawler saying, look how vicious he is. So they want people to think it was Sid Vicious. But I get blamed for that. Have you seen that on Twitter? No. Well, Corn. Oh yes, on Twitter or some wise asses on the internet. That well, you know, Cornette dressed him up as that Christmas creature. No, I didn't. I wasn't even there, and it wasn't even Owen. Um, where I came in the picture was they skipped Puerto Rico entirely for his bio, which. And I thought they have the Puerto Rico library, don't they? Well, that, was, that wasn't Carlos, that was Victor, wasn't it? But here's what happened was, after that point, he went to Puerto Rico somehow, because Dutch was booking, and Dutch had heard about him, maybe from somebody in Memphis, Lawler or whatever. But see, Dutch had been working for me in Smoky Mountain, doing the TV commentary and wrestling sometimes, but then... Uh, he got the job to book in Puerto Rico again, so he left and went down there, but we stayed in touch. And then he calls me one day and he says, well, I got a kid down here with island fever, which is basically, he, you know, he wants to be in the wrestling business, but he's had all he can stand in Puerto Rico. He's got to get the fuck out of here. He's going to go out of his mind. I said, well, what's he look like? He said he's seven feet tall. I said, okay, because... The last time that Dutch had, I'd had, I had talked to him about a seven footer was Mark Calloway from 1990 or whatever. And he told me, he said, he's, he's green, but he looks great. He's down. He was doomsday down there, which the, 
the red and streaming outfit and the black and the the hockey mask the deal that they showed and everything that was the outfit that he already had i just changed his name because i changed it to unibomb because of the unibomber so point is he was doomsday in puerto rico with that outfit but dutch said he you know he's green he's you know he's a good kid he wants to learn uh, he's very coachable, but he just needs to get out of Puerto Rico. Have you got anything for him? And that's where, uh, you know, I say yes, because I'd been talking to Eddie Gilbert. And I thought, what if we brought this guy in to be his tag team partner slash bodyguard backup, Eddie, the smaller guy with the big mouth that could cut a hell of a promo. And plus then... This kid could get on a job training if he's partners with Eddie Gilbert because Eddie, well, you know, what a worker he was. He had a mind for the business. So that was how we brought him to Knoxville. And as I said, just changed the name to Unibomb because that was in the news. And of course, his finish is going to be the power bomb, right? But it's Unibomb because it's the only one and blah, blah, blah. But then Eddie does the first TV and four weeks of TV, actually, the first TV taping. So he's on talking Unibomb up for a month and the big tag team match they're going to have with the Rock and Roll Express, I think. And by the time that, uh, you know, the thing comes about, he takes a job in Puerto Rico, which was kind of an interesting, because that's what it was, because Dutch was working for the office at Victor had. What was it, the IWA then? And Eddie went to work for Carlos, wasn't it? No, I think Eddie... Actually, I'm not sure, because Eddie went to book, didn't he? Well, that's what... But Dutch was booking. So, whatever. Maybe I was just the pipeline to fucking Puerto Rico. But to point it anyway, yes, everybody was either coming or going. So... That's where I had to press Al Snow into service because now I've got a a giant, mute, you know, hockey-masked goddamn monster that has no small, smart-ass with a big mouth. And we knew Al was a smaller, smart-ass and he could work, but then he couldn't really talk for the first few weeks, but then he came out of his shell. So anyway, that's how that happened. And then, you know, basically Glenn got a chance to work because what was that? That was January. So he got a chance to work for the next six months with Riggy Morton and Robert Gibson and uh, Dirty White Boy and Tracy Smothers and guys that could give him on-the-job training. And obviously being partners with Al, who had a ton of experience at that time, and then being in the heel locker room with guys like the bodies or you know whoever that we had at the time the funks coming in so he really got a chance to you know kind of get the the territory experience and learn from a lot of different guys before <clears throat> he finally had the the match with taker which was august at the super bowl of wrestling show that we did and that was that was the whole point of that. I mean, obviously, I'd been working as hard as I could to get The Undertaker, and I'd gotten him earlier in the year for the Johnson City show and the Bluegrass Brawl in Pikeville, but it didn't work out. We didn't have Knoxville going on a date that I could get him. So that was the first time we'd brought him to Knoxville, and it was a natural match because now this giant Unibombs had six months to powerbomb everybody and look impressive and then in comes the biggest star big man in the business and you know not only do people want to see it but also that was the idea when we brought taker to wcw the veterans worked with him or at least some of them did that was the idea and then we got undertaker to come to help kane and see a future pay-per-view opponent a guy that could you know move up to the wwf and then as we talked about in the Batista program they did, that's when we got Kane to come as he was established and work early on with Batista. Hey, can I ask you a question? Yes. You didn't know in January what the rest of 1995 would be for you and for Smoky Mountain Wrestling. No. Did you think you would only have Unibomb 
for eight months or did you think you would have him for at least a year? What did you think when you got him? How long did you think you'd actually be able to keep him there? Well, <laughs> just because of what he Which, looked like in WWF looking for. Well, but now, like that. but think about this. Think about this. There were a lot of guys either in the WWF or available to the WWF that just physically looked like that or close to that, maybe within a couple of inches of that. It wasn't, it still wasn't that easy because Glenn was very green and, and very, you know, that's what, what I'm saying is I wasn't looking like I've only got this guy for a limited amount of time. I was like, at that point, it was still, wow, look at the potential this guy has. He may go somewhere someday type of thing. Now, after three months, four months when he's getting better and you saw the footage where he's doing a lot more shit than he was in the the previous year's independent wrestling footage where he was just lumbering around. He started picking it up and he was smoother and he was learning from all those guys about how to be a bigger guy, even though, as they mentioned later on, he had to slow down more for Kane and start really lurk, working like a big man. At least he was... He wasn't killing people. He wasn't landing on their fucking head. He, he smoothed out. So when he first, to answer your question, when he first got there, it was like we've had a lot of guys that, you know, physically look like that and said, my God, and he can move, but can he put it together? And then after several months, it was like, wow, he's really getting better. You know, now you can see more, uh, more potential. And then, at that point, I knew they would be wanting to look at him, and that's why I was trying to put it in that direction because he was under no contract at all with me. What I was trying to do is we couldn't sign guys to contracts, but what I was trying to do was point all the guys to the WWF because that's who we were working with and make sure that we didn't lose them to WCW. So, you know, that's when we really wanted to make sure that they were noticing him. And the big part of that was Undertaker had seen him in April. And it's like, yeah, we'll keep an eye on this guy. But, you know, it's nothing like getting in the ring in front of any. You can't do it at a spot show either. It's like having a match in a gym. The best, you know, audition for Glenn at that point was in the biggest show we did where there's. 5,000 people there in a, you know, decent sized arena with television set up. And then Mark could get the whole fucking idea of what they might could do, which he did. Okay. Were you, were, <laughs> did you think you'd have Al Snow for more than eight months? A year? Yeah. To be quite honest, I thought we'd probably build the empire around Al Snow. No. Um, I didn't see them snatching Al up, to be honest, at that point, because remember, he's he's in the best shape of his life right now. In 1995, he was about 215 pounds, looked like a fucking strand of spaghetti. With someone like Kane, because it had already kind of been established with Smoky Mountain and WWS relationship, you know, Chris Candido, Tammy, Brian Lee, I mean, a number of people, it seemed like a logical guy for WWF. But with Al Snow, that was the beginning of, okay, this guy can work. This guy's on TV. If they don't get him, WCW will. That was the beginning of yeah. like, everyone who's going to be available, someone's going to go for him. There, there's some element to that. And, 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 but not, now, back up one second about Brian Lee. Brian Lee was not a Smoky Mountain project. Brian Lee was chosen as the underfaker because he and Mark were good friends at the time. until. Brian kind of drove a wedge in that yeah, one. Totally forgot he wasn't the Undertaker. <laughs> yeah, had told the police, but um, but anyway, but no, the the deal. That's why Mark picked him because he he was similar and he had grown the hair out in the whole nine yards, and they knew each other. But I I liked Brian as a as a heel in my territory. I don't know that if I would have ever given him a full throated endorsement as Vince. You need to bring this guy in; he'll draw you nothing but money. And I've you know. I'll just leave it at that. He he still never quite got the one thing that would made him take that next step. 
possibly a brain transplant. I don't know. I haven't seen Brian in 20 years. Anyway, uh, but nevertheless, so then in the biography episode that we've been meandering around about, the Isaac Yankum gimmick, and I think I've told you this before, but it's been quite a while. Don't know if the folks have heard it. All the talent that I either funneled to or helped develop for the WWF, I mean, starting again when the Smoky Mountain days with Chris Candido and Tammy and the Heavenly Bodies and et cetera, et cetera, Al Snow we talked about, and Glenn. Through OVW, even with Cena and Batista and Orton and whoever the fuck, two people Vince has called me about, excited. One was Isaac Yankum, <laughs> and the other one was Gene Snitsky. <laughs> <laughs> and the Snitsky, real quick, I'm sitting in whatever year it was is four. I moved back to the castle to two or three, 2003 ish, whatever I'm sitting in my office at my house and there the phone ring or rings. Yes. The caller ID. It's Vince's number. What the fuck? I answered. He's from the, the limo. It's the day, morning after raw. They're going to the goddamn airport, wherever the fuck to fly out. And he said, pal, I just want to thank you for Snitsky. I said, what? And he said, oh, he had a great debut. And that, I think that was the debut where he punted the the baby in the stands or knocked, caused a fucking miscarriage with Marlena or whatever they had go on. Didn't he punt a baby into the crowd? I think it was Lita's, he, not Marlena. It was Lita. No, not, not Mar I'm sorry. Marlena is the miscarriage that uh, Shit Stain and <laughs> Who Dat, his little buddy, wrote. Of the, the, he killed a baby for Lita or whatever. I don't fucking know, but the point is, it was pretty fucking brutal. And Snitsky had been down here in OVW for a few months, and, and I'm not saying, I mean, he was a great physical look and a great face, and I'm not knocking him. Whatever angle they had him do was just horrible. And he said, Vince said, well, I know we didn't give him give you much time with him, but uh, he did great. I just wanted to let you know, sometimes we pull people up and uh, they've got a sink or swim or what he's basically acknowledging we just pulled him up out of nowhere and did this but i loved it so thank you i'm like, oh well thank you and the previous time had been he called i was still in knoxville obviously and he called me one day i'm in my office in my house in knoxville you're gonna love the vignettes pal i'm like what <laughs> Because I knew they, had, they were bringing Glenn up, and I, but it, it, they didn't share the whole concept. I think, as Glenn uh, even said, you know, he, he maybe heard about this the day he showed up there. But, oh, you're going to love the vignettes. He's Dr. Isaac Yankum, DMD. And my heart just sunk. And I'm like, oh, my God. And he thought you would like and, that. Well, he's still telling me about, I mean, you know, he couldn't see my heart sink on the phone. He may have heard a, a slight air escaping my lungs sound, but he said, oh, it's going to be great, pal. And he's got, and he goes into the detail when he's selling something and he's really excited about it. He's got these teeth and a teeth and they're all green and they're rotten and they're grottled and they're, oh my God, it looks terrible. There's fungus growing out of his mouth. And he's, He's going to have so-and-so in the chair, and he's talking about the chair with the drill, and he's doing the Vince thing, talking about all the things that they had. <laughs> and he's going to be Lawler's dentist. And <laughs> God damn it. If you were Vince's dentist, the next time he came in, would you be like, oh, you know, by the way, before we get going, do we have a problem? I, I'll tell you what, if in 1995, if Vince McMahon went to a dentist that was watching wrestling and Vince knew about it, he'd change dentists. Um, but uh, that's, so anyway, nobody liked the fucking gimmick and everybody was kind of, everybody that knew Glenn was horrified because they were like, oh, this could be the kiss of death. And everybody that, you know, didn't really know him, didn't really care. just like, oh shit, rolling her eyes. Here's another fucking big guy with a goofy gimmick. And Lawler was able to get to, you know, some 
steam out of it with the kiss my foots and the whole thing and integrating into the Bret Hart deal. But basically the only thing it did for Glenn was get Brett to be on his side then like this poor fucking guy with his horrible gimmick. But everybody started seeing that. Yes. The guys there's talent here and they, you know, this guy is just the gimmick. So then what do they do? They give him, Another fucking rotten gimmick. It it wasn't that the gimmick this time was rotten. It's that it was rotten because somebody else had already done it in the fake diesel. And then, you know, again, the guys were rolling their eyes and I'm like, oh my God, how can this happen again? Because now I'm there for it, right? We've told that story a million times. Vince got to fuck it between our writing meeting on breaking up on Thursday afternoon or whatever, and me going into the arena on Saturday in Oklahoma, the boys are asking me, Razor and Diesel are coming back because of the live TV that morning where he got the idea that, fuck it, we're bringing them back. And it was Glenn and Rick Bogner was the guy's name, right? Yeah, the big titan. Well, then that, that he used the name Big Titan in Japan for outlaw groups in Japan and shit before he went to work for Titan Sports. I wonder if that's <laughs> I wonder if that's why they didn't like him from the start. He was Mike Awesome's partner over there. Well, good good for him. That's just lovely. But I mean, he did the best he could, but he was, you know, kind of there, right? Average. It wasn't going to work. But again, the guys were pulling for Glenn, but he's got to do what he's got to do. And it did, they're, they're in this biography episode, they're trying to make it sound like, well, that's what he needed to do. Because Nash said, well, he, he, he learned to slow down and work like a big man, like me. We've heard about the six moves of doom. It did make him slow down somewhat because Nash moved so slow but he was still uncomfortable because he still wasn't himself or something of his own making. I'm not saying that Glenn Jacobs was secretly Kane all along. It's like Flair just turned up the volume, but it was something that he got a chance to do himself and make him make his own from the first time people saw it. So, you know, that was, it was good practice, but nobody could have foreseen that. Because, and I've mentioned this before on one of the programs, that at the same time that uh, Vince had agreed to go for the, the Kane deal, which Bruce did get the idea. Bruce has always loved the, you know, the brother against brother thing. And the, I'm not knocking that, I'm, but I'm saying the whole, he'd always loved that whole story of Undertaker and then Kane and the blah, blah, blah. So he's got a lot of that. Does Bruce see himself as the Kane? in the relationship with Tom or the undertaker in the relationship with Tom? I, I, now, come on now. I'm asking a serious I, question. Neither one of them have ever set the other on fire. That you know of. That I'm aware of. of they Bruce didn't notice of, they were both in this. No one got asked if they were ever lit on fire by the other one. Well, Bruce named one of his kids Kane. Uh, but anyway, so it was Bruce's idea. The undertaker would have a brother. But as they were discussing you know, then putting it actually to reality, Vince had said, you know, cause he, he wanted me to fire Glenn up. He said, tell him he better get the killer instinct on this one. Cause that was Vince's thing. He doesn't have the killer instinct. He did. Well, it's good. You put him out there as a fucking evil dentist. He went from smoky mountain wrestling for six months in front of the biggest crowds he'd ever been in front of to fucking the WWF in front of the biggest crowds he'd ever been in front of. He's an evil dentist. And then he's somebody else trying to, you know, imitate somebody. So I, I was thinking when Vince was thinking that you want Frankenstein, but you presented him like young Frankenstein, like he was written by Mel Brooks. Anyway, the gimmick designs the same thing. Glenn said in this program, most people thought of Michael Myers or, you know, Jason Voorhees or whatever. Yes, we all did, except for Vince. <laughs> And I still think that he could have evolved into the superhero outfit because I'm just like, come on. The first time we see him, he had tights and boots made in the asylum. 
to, you know, wait for this day or whatever. But they, you know, obviously Creative Services sent the sketches over to Vince and he wanted the the superhero and the the covered up arm. Um they had the the did you see the clip of me in the studio in the ring with Glenn and, and it was Tony DeVito is I think was the opponent, uh, the workout partner there. But <laughs> every time I see that I, footage, I see more of it. I feel like, well, that, well, cause this, I was showing him how to go up for the tombstone and kind of Glenn, how to make sure he got him up for the tombstone. Cause he hadn't done that before, but I was fatter than a fucking hog. I weighed 275 pounds there. I'll have, you know, that's the biggest I ever was. Anyway, we have covered the Hell in a Cell debut many times and the, the Taker Kane rivalry. I mean, we've just, they've just done a program, but I actually, I really liked some of the updates that they did with Kane. I liked, I loved the electronic voice box deal that they had him doing. I thought that was spooky as shit. And that was, it was something new and different. Of course, I don't know if I don't win the title, I'll set myself on fire. You can tell when shit stain had gotten a firm, grip on the chair in that room uh the second fucking match they had he was set on fire but um it, it brought up also the king of ring king of the ring 98 was where kane beat austin for the title but nobody remembers that because it was after the fucking hell in a cell match with cactus and taker and it gets overlooked but that was a pretty hot fucking deal at the time no pun intended and um, do you think Kane is, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, you know, The Undertaker is widely considered Vince McMahon's best gimmick. Do you think Kane could be number two? Very possibly, yes. Now that you put it that way, because nobody ever asked that question. Nobody really did. Well, what's the second best one? Come up with, with another one that lasted as long. That was created by him, not something he got from the territories or something that was already tried out before. Yeah. Maybe even the second best one ever. There you go. Or Snitsky. I mean, one or... Or know, Snitsky. Yeah, one, one of the... Other. Depend, let's get them, to, let's <laughs> get them in a punt, pass, and kick competition to see if which one comes out ahead, but they'll use a baby instead of a football. <laughs> you remember the old radio blooper? Which one? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the cunt, pass, and pick competition. <laughs> I never heard that one, no. Yeah. No. Anyway, um, so then they, they started skipping ahead because I said I liked the one of the the updates of the cane gimmick with the electric, you know, voice deal. But then when they took the mask off, I never liked that because he was supposed to be burned. And then he was burned. Then Vince said, oh, easily explained. He was burned and disfigured in his mind. Well, God damn it. That's not the same fucking thing. It was to Vince, but when they first took the mask off, he had half his head shaved. Then he had all his head shaved. Then he had makeup. Then he didn't have makeup. And I, they had old Seamus and Drew comment that they didn't like the unmasking either, but I think more than that is when you start violating the story that you've already told about somebody that's gotten over and then you disregard big parts of it, that's when I think that you monkey with gimmicks and hurt gimmicks. But unfortunately, maybe that was kind of like the period where Undertaker just became a biker. Because then by the time they got the mask and the red outfit back, everybody was just happy to see it. They were like, oh. But um, Bruce was like, well, do you take the next step with this character and make him more human? He does think he's in the movie business. He has listened to Vince and Kevin Dunn for so long with their fucking gaga and hoo-ha. He's so full of shit, it's amazing. But but he doesn't, he believes it because he's listened to it from them and he's bought it. His Glenn's wife, Crystal, didn't like the unmasked haircut either. And then the shaved head and the eyebrows, we had absolutely no hair at all. Uh, but But he overcame... That, as I said, and then, you know, when the people got him back, it was like the Undertaker, okay, and then their, you know, reunions and major tag team matches and shit over the last several years, but then, you know, the last 
10 minutes was his life as a mayor, you know, appearing at the Oktoberfest and the Dogwood Festival. And, you know, just as I said in my preface, I would have been all in favor of Glenn Jacobs leading people and being a public servant until I see who he associates with and makes excuses for or ignores the exploits of. And I never thought, would have never thought, that he would, you know, be a part of supporting people like that. I think that's the thing that I've seen that's bothered people that, know him or have known him for years. It's not that he got susceptible or fell into everything. It's that he knows better and he's using this for his own personal gain, but he knows better. I don't see any way in the world he doesn't. He's in the same hall of fame as the prick. If they, if they go to the hall of fame (laughs) luncheons at the sportsman's lounge out there in fucking Rosita or Cucamonga or wherever, but well, this is a whole new version of wrestling history in just the last 30 seconds that you've written. <laughs> no one ever talks about the Hall of Fame being put in Reseda or Cucamonga. This is a new idea altogether. Where where did they, the, the old Cauliflower Alley banquets, back when Mike Mazurki was Studio around. Studio City. Was uh, Studio City, the uh, the, the sportsman, Sportsman's Lounge is what I believe it was. Sportsman's Lodge, maybe, or they maybe they lounged and lodged both. <laughs> Sometimes they lounged so long they got lodged in. Well, obviously, from the debut of Kane in 1998, I guess it was. No, no, 97? October, October 97. 97. Same day Brian Pillman died. Oh, that's right. We had to bring us down with that. But I was going to say, yeah. from the debut, a scary character. Lots of fans had nightmares. They thought they had nightmares about The Undertaker. Here's his undead, burned brother. But it was all in his mind, as it turns out. You have to wonder if the fans at home, maybe they need some help. They're a little scared. Or maybe Kane himself, because it was all in his mind. Maybe he could have used some help from the Sunday Scaries. Well, you know, Brian, I'll tell you what. That's a thing that a lot of people have. Sundays, you know what the Sunday scare? They give us a bunch of examples here. With the uh, the copy for the uh, the advertising for this fine product, they give us a lot of examples of Sunday scaries and how life can be scary and put you on edge, have you shaking like a dog shitting peach seeds. But I think it's simple enough to say that Sunday scaries are when you realize on Sunday that the following week is going to start the next day and your life is going to be the same way it was last week. That's a Sunday scary. That's a, that'll just smack you right in the face. Yep. Whatever you had to put up with last week, folks, you're going to be putting up with more of it this week. But that's why that Sunday scaries were manufactured. That's why they were brought into existence. Because folks, again, do you want to get up on Monday morning and do you want to feel despair? Do you want to feel gloom? Gloom, despair, and agony owe me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. Folks, I say no to you. You don't want to feel that. No, instead, what you want to do is you want to check out the Sunday Scary CBD gummies that, folks, they have been worked at. Now, it's not like that THC stuff that the young folks use to get all loopy. It's the CBD stuff that's scientifically been proven to chill you out, not make you cold, but make you relax, not make you shiver, but make you, ah, shut your brain off and let your muscles evaporate into a blissful state. Folks, as a matter of fact, with these Sunday scary CBD gummies, you'll almost evaporate entirely. Many people have just melted into the upholstery. Don't say that. They've had to be pried out with a spatula. Metaphorically speaking, yes. Metaphorically speaking, of course. They'd say, well, you know what? I can't feel my legs. So just (laughs) pry me out of this seat with a spatula. Metaphorically speaking, they may say that, but in actuality on the real world or in the real world, they are not saying these things. They're just enjoying the, the, the Sunday scaries properties experience. as yes properties the experience that's the word i was looking yes, for yes because sunday scaries are deliciously cute vitamin boosted 
They're cute. CBD gummies. They're cute. Did you just call them deliciously cute? They're delicious. That's what it says right on the package here. <laughs> deliciously cute vitamin boosted CBD gummies that are a must have because they work and chill you out fast while not getting you a sentence in a penitentiary in certain states. Let's say you're a horrible sleeper. You stare at the ceiling and you worry because you know the people that live upstairs are a couple that weigh 350 pounds apiece. And every time they start getting amorous, you think you're about to be crushed. It's like a sword of Damocles hanging over your head, folks. No, no, no. Just take a couple of the Sunday scary CBD gummies and when they get to bumping uglies, you won't give a shit. You'll roll over and blissfully fall asleep. Folks, once again, whether it's Sunday or any other day of the week that you are scared or anxious or nervous or saying, oh, shit. Well, you don't need to do all that because the Sunday Scary CBD gummies were made to defeat the various crapola that life will throw at you. Especially other people. If you've got other people throwing stuff at you, well, call the police because that's assault and it's illegal. But if they're only metaphorically pitching it over the fence in your direction, you take two CBD gummies every day to keep the scaries away. And right now, if you go to sundayscaries.com, that Sunday is in the day of the fucking week. If you can't spell that, I can't fucking help you. You got bigger problems than not being able to sleep. <laughs> Sunday scaries, <laughs> S-C-A, what, what's the matter with you? <laughs> S-C-A. R-I-E-S, sundayscaries.com. Some people may do E-Y-S, and that will that just won't work. Sundayscaries.com, and use the promo code J-C-E. You're going to get 25% off, not 25% off the relaxation or 25% off the sleep, but 25% off the cost, which is already negligible to begin with. Sundayscaries.com, use the promo code J-C-E for 25% off the Sunday Scaries CBD gummies, which you'll get 100% of your Sunday Scaries off the experience if you take the Sunday Scaries CBD gummies that you get 25% of the price of them off. It'll take care of all of your Sunday Scaries, but you'll get 25% off the actual cost of the purchase. SundayScaries.com. Sunday Scaries. That's what I said. 